And please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Reading from John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd ask if you would turn in your Bibles to this passage in John chapter 15, if you've not done so already. John chapter 15. Well, we're going to finish up this section of John today, and uh, after vacation, we'll move into the next section of John chapter 15. Um, But I want us to begin by considering a wonderful truth that uh, I hope will make our hearts sing. Here it is. God isn't calling you to make great promises to him. He is calling you to trust his great promises to you. Really think about that. What a different perspective that makes. What is God calling you to? He's not calling you to say, I need to do this and and a list of things he wants you to do. He's calling you to trust him. If I could sum up John 15, 1 through 11, that is at the heart of this. That's what Jesus is trying to communicate, communicate to his disciples, communicate to us. It's really the heart of the gospel. What are you going to trust? God is really working to increase our dependence on him in everything so that we will continually live by faith. That's really what verse 5 is all about in John 15. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, For apart from me, you can do nothing. God wants to increase our dependence upon him. To say, you really can do nothing apart from Christ. Now, why I I emphasize that this morning is, is because our tendency in a passage like John 15 is often to come to it and then ask, you know, what steps do we need to take to be more a more fruitful Christian? Because we often come to a passage like this and we just say, well, what do I need to do? We jump right to that without actually considering what has God done? What is he really saying? As I inter- interacted about this text this week with somebody here, Uh, that was kind of their point as well. They said, you know, I've heard messages on like, you know, five steps to abiding in Christ, that kind of thing. And it's always focused on what you do, what you do, what you do. 
And the problem with this approach is that it often places the emphasis on ourselves and what we do or don't do to produce a fruitful life in Jesus Christ. That's the wrong focus here. God is not asking us to do more. He's asking us to believe Him. Faith in Jesus Christ is the key to abiding. Abiding equals faith in Jesus. And too often we can believe what we think or what we feel more than what God has said and done in Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean that we don't have anything to do? We just believe and just sit back and, and watch things happen and just God does just give us a supernatural zap? No, absolutely not. But we have to understand the nature of faith. Faith is active, not passive, and it always rests upon its object. What are you trusting in? Faith is a continual, vital trust in God and his word, in Christ and the gospel. And so a child of God can only experience the benefits of God's work, the blessings of God's work, to the extent that they believe and act upon it. That doesn't mean it's not true for them. It just means they're not going to actually enter into it. There are some things that are freely given by the grace of God, but God's waiting for us to trust him, and we're not going to actually know those things until we're willing to step out in faith. In fact, I came across a great cross-reference here. I'm just going to quote it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. That's what one of the points is that the writer of Hebrews is making is that they studied and they had the word, but when they studied, they did not study it with eyes of faith. This is another reason why, as I've been saying the last several weeks, we need to make a clear distinction when we come to John 15 between salvation and discipleship. Perhaps another, a better way to put this distinction is between having a relationship with Jesus Christ and fellowship with Jesus Christ. As we know and we've been studying, the Gospel of John's main focus is primarily to unbelievers, to the unsaved. But as we come to the upper room discourse, which we've been looking at, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he's speaking to them about how do you have fellowship with him, not how do you get a relationship. He's dealt with that. He's talked about how to have a reconciled relationship with God through him. But they have that. His disciples have faith in him for salvation already. And you say, how do we know that? Look at verse 3. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. He talked about that back in in John 13. He says, you know, you've already been cleaned. I can wash your feet. You don't need to be saved again. You're already saved. And so he's not talking about justification here. He's talking about progressing in sanctification. And so Jesus is teaching us really the working principle of abiding. No fruit is possible without abiding. Well, last Sunday we examined the truth of the believer as an abiding branch. And this this metaphor here is vitally important. We've seen and examined how Jesus is the true vine, how God the Father is the vine dresser, and we are branches. And we discovered the truth that abiding in Christ and producing fruit really is Growing into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what fruit means. It's to become like Christ. And we talked about that in more detail last Sunday. And the goal of the Christian life is to know Christ and to make him known by becoming like him for God's glory. 
fruit is less what we do and more what we become. And so as God's people, we are called to that same purpose, that same objective that Jesus Christ himself pursued, which was to live for the glory of God the Father, as he expresses it in verse 8. Fruit bearing equals pursuing Jesus Christ. And so if you don't abide in the vine, you won't become like him. Practically. Positionally, you are like him. You are holy and blameless in him. Again, that distinction is important. And in the context of John 15... We try to zero in a little bit of what does it mean to become like Christ. And what we discovered was this, that becoming like Christ means loving God and loving others as he commands us to love them. It means putting off our sinful ways of thinking, of speaking, of acting, and putting on thoughts and words and actions that reflect who he is. And of course, all of this, as we examined All of this is with the wonderful assurance that if you have truly put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and Him alone, you are eternally secure. We looked at verse 6, what that verse really means and what it's speaking to, that it's not a loss of salvation. Now because of sin in our lives, I do need to say this, because of sin in our lives, we choose to live in unrepentant sin. The Bible does say we can lose things. The Bible says we can lose joy. Clearly from this, we will not be joyful Christians because of sin. We can lose our fellowship with him. We will never lose our relationship. I think that's the wonderful thing, that picture of adoption is why it's so cemented in Scripture, is these two kids, they can never, ever, no matter what they try to do, they will always, forever forth, be Van Gordons. In fact, on their birth certificate, they got new birth certificates. And it says, Riley, Katie Van Gordon. And they have all the rights and all the privileges of being a Van Gordon. That's their name now. That's the picture God has given to us in Scripture. You have all the rights and the privileges of being in Christ, of being a child of God. You can't do anything to be disowned by the Father. But you can displease the Father. You can lose fellowship with Him by your sin. You also can lose your testimony. Philippians chapter 2, Paul talks about that in verses 14 through 16, that your testimony will be hindered. And of course, we also looked last week at our heavenly rewards in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We can lose rewards, but we can never lose our salvation. Well, now let's talk about the practice. What does it mean to abide? How do we do it? And what are the results of abiding? Well, the next point, point number two, is the basics, if you would, of abiding. What are the basics of abiding? The word abide simply means to remain or live in. It really describes an attitude of dependence and reliance on Christ. If you're abiding, you're depending. You're you're waiting to draw strength from the vine. I mean, think about that picture. Where does the branch get its life? Where does it get its strength to be able to produce fruit? It has to be connected to the vine, the main source, or it won't. It will die. And so we are to make Jesus Christ our permanent abiding, our permanent home. Now the question becomes, how do we do that? Well, verse 7 tells us one way. If you abide in me and my what? Words abide in you. That's how we do it. His word is the key to this. His word must abide in us, and we must abide in his word. In fact, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, it echoes this truth. It says, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Or that word dwell there is the same word, abide in you. And here's the key. 
We're not called just to know the truth. This is more than just intellectual knowledge. Truly abiding in the word results in obeying the truth. Look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. This is not just why I have a lot of the head knowledge about the word of God. This is more, okay, am I actually doing what God has asked me to do? Because here's the the bottom line. You can memorize scripture all day long. You can listen to really good biblical sermons. You can read really good biblical books. But all of that is useless unless you obey it. Doesn't Jesus often say that to us? In fact, he said it already. If I can find the reference here. Back in John chapter 13, verse 17, he says, If you know these things, blessed are you if you know them. Actually, that's not what it says, though, right? Blessed are you if you what? Do them. He constantly says that. We sang about the solid rock this morning. And Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 7 talks about that. You have two men there. One's a foolish man, one's a wise man. They both heard the word. They both heard. But one did what? Obeyed it. One did and practiced it. That's what's going on here. Discipleship comes from abiding in the word. I love how Sinclair Ferguson explains this truth of abiding. He says, in a nutshell, abiding in Christ means allowing his word to fill our minds, to direct our wills, and to transform our affections. Then, of course, as Christ's word dwells in us and the spirit fills us, we will pray in a way consistent with the will of God and discover the truth of our Lord's often misapplied promise, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Did you notice the connection there, verse 7? Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Well, if you're abiding in the word of God, and the word is abiding in you, and then you come and pray, what are you going to ask? Are you going to ask for something that is completely selfish and self-focused? No. That's why we can never, ever separate the word of God and prayer. They, are, they go hand in hand. Now, practically, what does this mean? Well, I think the obvious application is we need to take the time to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We need to take the time to be in his word. See, here's the thing. We read a passage like this, and we see a verse like verse 11, where Jesus says, I want you to have joy. And we're like, yeah, sign me up for that. I want to have joy too. How do you do that? By abiding in him. Many of us want the joy without the requirements. Now, as we talked about last week, joy is different than happiness. This is not, well, that means I'm going to, no matter my circumstances, I'm just going to walk around and, oh, everything's great. No. Joy does not depend on circumstances, as we talked about with these disciples. They're in some pretty bad circumstances right now, and it's going to get worse. They're really, if you would, emotionally, they're down in the dumps. And yet Jesus still says to them, I want you to have joy. You can have joy, even in the midst of heartache and bad circumstances. Now, what's the main object, one of the main obstacles, I guess I'd say, to to having this joy, to abiding? Well, I think at least for the American church, here's what I'd say it would be. Busyness. Busyness is one of the main obstacles why we don't abide more. Now, why is that? Because busyness keeps us from actually dealing with the issues in our hearts. It distracts us. 
It drowns out the Spirit of God when he's trying to speak to us from his word. And so we stay busy often, even in good things. That's the key. Maybe we're doing good things. But sometimes I think we stay busy because then it helps us not deal with the real spiritual significant issues in our heart. I don't want to deal with it. I just keep pushing it off. I'm just too busy. The point is, as we live in his word, we will abide in him. And as we abide, we will increasingly live in his word. I thought about it this way. <clears throat> I, I, I left it in my office. Usually on Sunday mornings, I mute my phone and do that. But I thought, what if we actually treated God's word like we did our smartphones? I mean, we're almost never without our phones anymore, right? Now, many of you, some of you are still holdouts, and I'm, I refuse to get it, Sandy and Larry. But <laughs> and, and, and I'll be honest, there have been a few times like, well, I'll just text, and I can't text Sandy because she's not going to get a text. But in part, that's not bad, but, you know, we always have this thing. It's always at our fingertips. I can never not be without my phone. My wife there. She knows what that's about. <laughs> Inside joke. No, she did not say that. That's not her. That's not her. <laughs> but what if we treated the Word of God in the same way? I mean, obviously, you know, it's like, well, it's a bigger book to carry this around. Like my phone is a lot easier to put in my pocket than this book. But still, what if we treated... And when we talk about the word, what we're really talking about here is relationship. The purpose of this book is so you can know God. So you can fellowship with him. It's not just so you can have facts. Those are important. But it's so you can actually commune with him. That's how he speaks to you. So what if we treated our relationship with God like our smartphones? Well, when we abide, what are the results what are the blessings of abiding in Christ? And he gives us four blessings here. The first blessing is that, as verse 7 says, our prayers will be answered. When we abide in him, our prayers will be answered. Our praying is not in vain. If we abide in Christ and his word abides in us, we can expect God to answer us. Now, it will be according to his time. But he says right there, what? Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And so Jesus tells us to pray for what we want, provided our wants are shaped by his word. In fact, here's the thing I've seen. Praying will take on really new life for us. It will take on new purpose when we do it this way. Uh, Eugene Peterson said it like this. He says, when we abide in Christ, our prayers cease to be disguised efforts to increase personal possessions and power and become the means of being increased in Christ. Because let's be honest, and I have to be honest, sometimes my prayer life is more about me getting what I want in a selfish way than what actually seeking his kingdom. In other words, we will become less concerned about our earthly kingdoms and what's going on here, and we'll become more concerned about his kingdom. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why is that at the beginning of that model prayer? Because that's where God wants us to focus. We'll be Focusing then more on knowing Jesus Christ, on making Jesus Christ more known, rather than on worrying about whether I have what I need, whether I look good in front of others. The second thing, the second blessing is that our lives will really glorify God, as verse 8 tells us. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So when we abide in Christ and he produces fruit in us, we actually display the greatness of Jesus Christ to all to see. 
And when we glorify Jesus Christ, we glorify God the Father. Third thing is this. We'll be motivated by love. Verses 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So Jesus says also to abide in his love, to rest in that, to dwell in his love. Believers, we are to rest our life in the love of Christ. We are to consider how Jesus loves us in the gospel. In fact, look at verse 13. We'll see this in a couple weeks. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. Never, ever allow yourself to drift away from the wonderful truth of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Make his love your home by meditating on the gospel daily. In fact, this is one of the things we talked about at our men's retreat recently. And Brian Wexler, I think he sums up this so well of what God wants for us. Here's what he said. He says, knowing who you are and what you have been given in Jesus Christ is foundational to the Christian life. You don't need to try harder at doing. You need to try harder at believing. The Christian life is learning the fullness of the salvation God has given to you in Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. It's learning this great gift that you have been given of grace. In other words, we must look not to do better. We must look to know Jesus more. And how do we do that? By faith. And the fourth thing we see here, the fourth blessing is that we will live in an abundant joy, as verse 11 says. Let's be honest, in our world and even in our churches today, people are scrambling for joy, scrambling for something to fill that void. But very few find it because they are looking for it in all the wrong ways and in all the wrong places. God says joy comes to those who abide in Jesus. It can be yours, but only as you by faith. Obey what Christ commands you to do, and that is to abide. And he says, I will give you joy. Even in the midst of difficult circumstances, you will have joy. So I thought about it this week. You know what? What every single one of us in this room really wants, God in Christ has given to us. He wants us to actually trust that he has. So let's make this pra- uh, Practical. Hudson Taylor, I know many of you know that name. If you don't know who that is, he was a kind of a father, one of the beginning uh, missionaries of what we call Western missions. He founded the China Inland Mission in the 19th century. Went to China by himself before we know what you know, modern day missions is. He went all by himself and, and without a, without a uh, missionary playbook other than the Bible. And, and went there and uh, represented Christ and led the Chinese, many of the Chinese people to the Lord. And in his early years, he recounts that he had what he called many, uh, many successes as a missionary. And in, in turn, he'd actually convinced others to join him and follow him into the field. And so he began this whole mission. But then he recounts as a Christian, as a missionary, Faithfully serving the Lord, he said he was a miserable Christian. That's how he described it, a miserable Christian. He said he had no joy at all. He was doing the work of ministry, preaching Jesus Christ, but he had no joy. And in 1869, someone had given him a little book entitled Christ is All. And in that book, he said, I finally learned the secret of, of abiding in Christ. That was his words. Here was the secret. You ready? He needed to believe that he was a branch. 
He needed to believe he was a branch. Actually, he put it this way. I am a part of Jesus and have just to believe it and act upon it. He said, that changes life forever. Coming to that simple conclusion, I'm a branch. I need to abide. I need to stop striving. I need to stop fighting my Lord and simply rest and abide in him. And he says, when he did that, he began to find the joy that God is promising here. He found the strength that he never had before. He said, the answer was never in my effort. And that's where I was focused. It was inviting in Jesus Christ. Beloved, how do we make this practical for us? Simply put, are you abiding in Christ today? Is he your true joy and true delight? Or have you replaced that intimate connection with Jesus Christ, as we've talked about several times, with that plastic fruit of religion, apart from a relationship? Do you faithfully pursue Christ in his word and through the gospel? Even if it might feel dull. Are you just going through the motions? Are you just using scripture, singing songs, using spiritually sounding words, maybe to fool yourself or to fool others? And thinking, I'm okay as a Christian, but I really don't have the joy. Here's the thing, no matter what you might be doing externally, and maybe you're fooling us, you're not going to fool God. He knows exactly if you're abiding or not. But here's a word of encouragement. None of us, none of us will ever do this perfectly this side of heaven. We will forget. That's why God always tells us, believe again. Keep believing. What we really believe is borne out most clearly in what we do, not necessarily in what we say. And so based on how you characteristically relate to Jesus, based on what you do with his word on a day-to-day basis, what is it that this passage is telling you right now? You really need to believe this, and you're not. You need to start really believing what God is saying to you right here. And stop making excuses for not believing it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these last several weeks in this wonderful passage. Lord, I pray that uh, your people will walk away from this filled with great strength, and joy, filled, Lord, with the awe of your grace in Jesus Christ. You long so much to give us those things we desire, and, Lord, you have provided them in yourself. All that we need is in Jesus. Help us to rest, to abide in the true vine. Help us, Lord, to cooperate with the vine dresser, when he is pruning us, when he's discipling us to become more fruitful. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful text. May it grow in our hearts. May we walk by faith and not by sight. I pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.